episode 273. It's kind of a double-edged sword, right? Almost contradicts itself in that if you have any real ego in what you do, you know, any pride, you're going to go to the training. You're going to find a way, force yourself to go. And yet, on the flip side, I'm not familiar with too many other industries that do not shoulder the burden of providing the training and getting their employees training. It's usually on the business's time. And if it's not, the employee is still compensated. Their travel to get to the training is compensated. They're compensated for sitting in that training. Welcome, aftermarketers, to Remarkable Results Radio. Listen to learn just one thing from today's episode on your journey to remarkable results. Hello, aftermarket professionals from North America and around the world to Technician Roundtable, Part 3. We're here in Episode 273 of the Remarkable Results Radio Podcast with Matt Fonslow, Bob Hype, and Peter Laundry, And we assembled one evening in late October 2017, and we approached the interview with an open mic format. You're in for a treat. Storytelling at its best. We agreed that anything goes. Agree or disagree with these three diagnosticians, they've got opinions. This episode is supported by Federal Mogul Motor Parts. Search for parts, get the latest technical updates, and sign up for their Garage Rewards Loyalty Program at their website, fmmotorparts.com. By the way, it was such an honor to be at Apex 17 this year with a studio. Now keep an ear to your favorite listening app for the release of these interviews. While at Apex this year, I made a ton of new friends, and I'd like to welcome new Facebook friends, Brenda Hansen-White, Bill Belong, and Robert Sire, and new LinkedIn connections, David Dickey from Down Under, and Kyle Byrne, AAP. Thank you for your connections. For every one of my social links, go to remarkableresults.biz slash social. I'm positive that the quality and the value of the interviews will support your continual learning strategy. I'm proud to be able to bring you three podcast episodes each week to fill your library with powerful learning content. Hey, don't forget to download the podcast's own listening app. Go to remarkableresults.biz slash app or to your app store and search for Remarkable Results Radio. You'll be so glad you did. Now, gear up for the Technician Roundtable, Volume 3, with Matt Fonslow, Diagnostician and Shop Manager at Riverside Automotive in Red Wing, Minnesota, and Bob Hype, who works for Mobile Auto Solutions, LLC, as Lead Tech and Technician Manager, and Peter Landry, Mobile Diagnostician for Mobile Auto Solutions. Find the talking points at RemarkableResults.biz slash E273. Hey, we had an open mic session with Matt, Bob, and Peter that covered what was on their mind that night. Among the topics tech pay, benefits, and the importance of personal and shop owner investment in training. We talked mandatory certification of technicians and the so-called technician shortage, and they have their opinions. We also hear about the great commitment of top technicians to seek out great training, even on their own because of their desire to learn and be the best at their craft. This discussion is not without his very strong perspectives that will challenge thinking and maybe even convert an outlier into the fold. Now, listen to our Technician Roundtable, Volume 3, with Matt Fonslow, Bob Hype, and Peter Landry. Welcome, everyone, to the Technician's Roundtable, Part 3. It's amazing how we can pull this thing off. It only takes three months to find a schedule that works for everybody. And then we're here at night, and I'm looking at you guys, and you're half sleeping because you've all worked all day. How do you do it? Drugs. Lots of drugs. And by drugs, I mean caffeine and, you know, legal over-the-counter type. Sleep's over So, guys, what's going on? And, and I ask that because I think I know. Uh, Pete, you just uh, sold your business, and now you work for Kevin DeVito's company. You now are peers working for the same company. Bob, you wrote a great article, by the way, just recently. Uh, and I know by the time this episode gets out, it will have been published in ABRN. Yeah, the other two don't know about this. Yeah, they may not. And I had the privilege today to read this thing while I was at lunch on my little smartphone, and I just couldn't put it down. It was well written, and it was uh, it was profound. Tell me, Matt, about this great roundtable you were on. You were interviewed by Motor Age. It was uh, it was all about differences in the industry. What's going on? All the all the changes. Yeah, yeah I think it was just the industry as a whole, and uh, some of the pitfalls we're running into, 
And we didn't have enough time to go into maybe some solutions, but a colleague of Pete, Bob, and mine was involved. Scott Manna. Scott Manna. Yep. Scott uh, Manna. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Skip Potter and uh, former uh, main guy with NASTA. Yep. And yeah, I interviewed Skip and Trish uh, Serator and, of course, Pete Meyer and you, Matt. And the only person that's on the list that I that has not been on the show is Scott Manna. And someday, now we got Jim Morton checked, you know, hopefully we uh, we can do Scott and then maybe Thornton one day. You brought up some great points there, Matt, about pay. You've been very vocal uh, as you've been on the town halls and the, the rants that I, I see in Facebook about this. And you know, keep it up. Your message needs to, you know, be carried by many more people. Everybody wants to be rich, of course, but I think most of us, we're not after getting rich. We're just looking for being able to provide, think about the future. And that's what some uh, industries and career choices would allow you out of repair, at least for the uh, repair text isn't necessarily uh, guaranteed, not nearly at a high enough percentage uh, of the workforce. Start asking people what they're, what they get, you know, what they have for benefits. And a lot of them, uh, you know, maybe uniforms, when it really comes down to it, unfortunately, too many. And it goes beyond just the, the, the compensation, too. Also, I think it goes right into training. We were talking about that recently with a uh, parts distributor here that provides training. And the low numbers, you know, they might have to close down this region because there's not enough attendees. Is that because of owners won't pay <clears throat> or just technicians won't go or a combination thereof it's probably a combination yeah, but i think so there's too many people that are not willing to invest in themselves and if you're not willing to invest in yourself how do you sell that to your employer as a worthwhile type yeah. of thing it's kind of a double-edged sword right it almost contradicts yourself yep. or almost contradicts itself in that if you have any real ego and what you do, you know, any pride, you're going to go to the training. You're going to find a way, force yourself to go. And yet on the flip side, I'm not familiar with too many other industries that do not shoulder the burden of providing the training and getting their employees training. It's usually on the business's time. And if it's not, the employee is still compensated. Their travel to get to the training is compensated. They're compensated for sitting in that training. And then uh, that's just not something that we have happen. Is it because in the early 70 some years, it was so easy? You didn't have to know much. You'd learn. Hey, models didn't change. And now that we're in a tumultuous you know, world of change, and it's it's faster than anyone could ever get training. The world hasn't woke up to this, and and I guess the reason why we talk about it on the podcast that it's written about is that we have to change the culture of the shop owner, of the technician, uh, the consumer, consumer, shop owner. Regardless, the shop owner, the the shop has the profit enough to handle all of this. You know, the shop owner deserves to get compensated well and fairly. But they not. need profits. Yeah, they need the profits to buy the equipment to compensate technicians beyond just wages, but benefits, training. The money's got to come from somewhere. It comes from, you know, the motoring public. Either we, as a trade or individual businessmen, have to get better about uh, valuing ourselves and conveying that value to the clients and getting paid, profiting. Well, the other part about it is you've got people running around to low-end shops still offering $10, $20 oil changes. I mean, just catering to the bottom feeders. And the reality is it's expensive to own a car today. One of your podcasts talked about the, the onset of General Motors and some other uh, people coming out with the whole idea of leasing a car that includes everything. Cradle to grave. Yeah. Cad Cadillac book. Cadillac book. B-O-O-K. And it was. How many uh, people have the ability to pay that lease though? 
Yeah, but what was so interesting is is they did the math, Bob, and it basically it, it, the insurance was in it. Every, everything was in, 100% of anything that would cost you. And apparently there's some people that say, I don't have to worry about a thing. I have to worry about one thing, and I turn it in once a year? I would be seriously looking at it. But I'm, what I'm saying is if you look at the average person, for the most part, these are higher-end cars. I get that. There's always stuff way up on top, like ATIS systems came out on, you know, the higher end cars and then they That's slowly. That's going to be everything, though. Yeah, I understand that. But, but you know, there were, years ago, a lot of them systems were showing up and now they're they're going to be universal. You take a, a, a program like what's going on with Cadillac and some others that are looking to rent a car. And, and, and again, transportation as a service, T-A-A-S, please learn that new acronym. Once those are done and they're tried at the level of Cadillac and you take an affordable vehicle, maybe it's a Camry or something like that, and there's another level of of, of customer base, person, income level, demographic, we're in a disruptive world in, in the things that we do. If we're going to disrupt, guys, Pete Meyer brought up in that article, maybe it's time for mandatory certification for shops and technicians. What do you guys think about that? I'm torn. Part of me likes the idea. You know, as a profession, it makes sense. If we do it, it's going to have to be an evolution. We, we can't just say January 2018, you're either certified, you know, by presumably by ASE, which would not be a bad idea in the area that you were providing professional level service or who's, who's the guy carrying the stick? Yeah. It would have to involve the if government. If you don't right? have somebody carrying the stick really going out there and making sure this stuff is happening, it's crap. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of revenue. You have to have enforcement. If you don't have serious truthful enforcement, then it's a joke. You have Michigan. You're right. We need to find out, though, uh, from, you know, uh, certified financial planners, who's their stick? Um, I know the doctors have a big board. That's their stick. There are a lot of other certified professionals out there that that they've been able to police themselves somehow. But at at the other end, the consumers now know that there are these professionals that have been certified. And if you take the case, Bob, of that, you know, that insurance claim that happened, and I think it was in Texas, right? Yeah, right. That's huge. What happened? I'm not saying that it can't happen. I'm just saying that if you don't have enforcement, then why it's, have it, it? it? It's worthless. It's but a I, joke. I understand. And, and I think you got to figure that out. Right. No, I'm, and I'm all for that. I, I'm 100% on board. But we have a shortage now with no regulation. Can you imagine all of a sudden? No, you're wrong. We'd break it. You you think we have a shortage of technicians okay. right now? Well, we, we have do. a shortage of competency and we have an abundance of incompetency. Depending on the area, I mean, there's so many shops and I'm very much of a capitalist that they drag down the cost of doing business to where a shop can't really survive unless they're paying these guys nothing. Tanya Harding them, whack them right on the knees and get, take them out. And you got to be ruthless. You got to take the IATNs, the identifixes and all these guys and say, no, I'm not going to help you. You're not helping yourself. You're a detriment to the industry. Bye-bye. Bye. I just think with the the struggles to find, you know, technicians now, you know, and I think when I talk about that, we're hoping they're qualified or competent. Uh, if we flip the switch and demand regulation, we break. It breaks the system. So how do you do that? That's why I said it, it's got to be a little more evolutionary. It, it wouldn't be like a, a switch flip. It would have to be, there would have to be a build up. There'd have to be some. It's a time. paradigm shift. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you have to get everybody behind it. And why wouldn't they? Know why you install Felpro, the gaskets professionals trust? Every part that goes into a Felpro box is validated and approved by a Felpro engineer. Product testing and validation is an integral part of Felpro's engineering, manufacturing, and field testing, 
where vehicles undergo tests that log over 1 million miles every year. They also reach out to you, the pro, through technology blogs and their technical forums to listen, learn, and keep in touch with you. It's amazing to think that Felpro produces over 325,000 gaskets per day. That's 325,000 per day in their 1 million square foot facility in Skokie, Illinois. Under the same roof, engineering and manufacturing uphold Felpro quality, utilizing 4,500 active production tools with tooling tolerances to 5 microns. Now that's smaller than a human hair. A tight tolerance like that ensures the sealing ability of Felpro gaskets. And their own in-house chem lab develops proprietary formulations like Permadry Plus to produce 35,000 molded rubber sealing components every day. Plus, with Felpro, you get coverage from 1955 of 96% of all domestics and 93% of all import vehicles. So feel confident that with new engines and new technologies, Felpro will be there with innovative solutions to solve your customers' sealing problems. Felpro, the gaskets professionals trust. Go to felpro-only.com for more information. You've always counted on Moog to keep you ahead of the pack when it comes to chassis innovation. Well, they've done it again. Most recently launched is the Moog ball joint with a pre-installed integral dust boot. It's designed exclusively for compression-loaded suspension systems, providing superior strength and durability for these types of vehicle applications. The dust boot is made from higher strength materials and comes pre-installed, saving you time because it's easier to install. It also has a larger contact area against the stud, which makes a more effective seal. For your customers, the unit uses Moog's powdered metal gusher bearing that provides longer life and controlled radial and axial movement. You get the industry's leading coverage of 10,000 SKUs, including 4,600 for foreign applications. Hey, you've been installing Moog confidently for years. And now you know why. And so when I interview the trainers and I interview the professional technicians that are out there and the shop owners that go to training at nauseum and, and they're the ones responsible for these big training events that we have. And, you, you know, what everyone says, the usual suspects are there. It may have been one of you guys who may have said that to me uh, one time in the past. Well, we need to have, you know, instead of 2,000 at Vision, there needs to be 5,000 at Vision in the other part of the industry. And in fact, who was it that I just interviewed? Oh, it was it was the guys who put on Super Saturday in, in Pennsylvania. They believe 80% of uh, the working techs need education. Years ago, I worked with the CAN conference. And the first year the CAN conference went off, we had um, somewhere in the ne- neighborhood of 200 attendees. Now, when I say the attendees is probably the wrong word because that included everyone. That was the vendors, the, peop- the, the technicians, the shop owners. That was everyone. I was happy to s- see that given it was pulled off in four months. But the reality of it is Chicago land area is 11 million or so. And how many technicians and shops and all the rest of it uh, make up that 11 million and service at 11 million? And you got 200 and 50% of those were from out of state. There's a massive problem with people and shops unwilling to own, they need training. Here's something amusing. I was talking about this last night because I just happened to be at a training class last night. When I went to work for my boss, one of the things that I demanded was non-negotiable on my end. I needed six classes of the, uh, a year with automotive seminars. In the negotiation, it was... There's no training out there that will address what we do because we work on cars that are newer than any of the training that is out there. And that is correct to a T. But the thing is, good training gives you thought process that will transfer to other things. Once I got the boss 
to agree that I'm on taking these classes. And then I got him to go to some classes. Now he wants all of the employees to go to these classes. You also go to Vision as a group, don't you? Last year was our first year as a group. Uh, the whole company shut down and it was a uh, it was a big deal. And Kevin said, we will do this every year. It a lot has to do with Kevin understands that you might take a class and it's not directly correlated to what you do, but you get thought processes and you get understanding that make it so you can do other jobs. And that is what tr real good training is about. Mm -hmm. And what that's what too many people don't understand is, I mean, you can't become a Matt Fanslow, a John Thornton, a Scott Manna, all of the rest of this. When you don't invest in yourself and invest in yourself is taking time. Even if your owner paying the wage, you have to take the time. And, and I'm a, very much of a person that believes the owner should invest in you and you should invest in you. So it shouldn't be, I'm going to go just because the owner is going to pay the way and he's going to pay my salary. Everybody needs to own some of it. Otherwise you don't get as much out of it. You had mentioned, I don't know how many techs were in uh, Illinois. So of course I had to ask Mr. Google, it would appear there's uh, well, a 2016 study suggested uh, 15,040 tax employed in Chicago. Automotive seminars has six locations of training in Chicagoland area that get maybe 40, 50 guys. And then they got the can conference does this year. There was no way there's 200 guys. It was lower than that. Really? And many from out of state. It's well, insane. You should be able to fill up three hotels. You should be able to, I mean, Auto Mechanica, I don't think is coming back to Chicago because it is so expensive and it is such a poor turnout. Yeah, Atlanta next year. There's a problem with the thought process of the technician and the owner. I I was in a the shop. The thought we process did or, or the perceived goal together because show me why. You know, show me why I should go to training other than I have a passion or whatever. I want to do it. Matt brings, brings up frequently compensation. You know, what, what's in it for me? I'm going to work more hours. I'm going to get more. I was in a uh, shop like, in the, in the, in the spring. And I m mentioned that, uh, I mean, I guess it was probably winter that we were closing as a business to go to vision. What's that? explain to them it's the largest conference in the country la 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 oh that that's interesting i said are you guys going to auto mechanica what's that i mean it, it's it's the market they don't even have too. a clue as to what's out there they don't want to even yeah. know and i said i told them auto mechanica if i was a business owner i said this thing is free I would close on a Saturday and I'd send every one of my guys to this thing because it wouldn't cost me anything other than closing on a day. And the rewards would be so great. It, it, they're paying me to come in and fix their stuff because they're unable to figure it out themselves. Why? Because I go to training. Guys, I recently interviewed a guy named Leon Anderson. And he has this incredible training culture. He believes in training to the point where if he loses his people, he's thrilled and he's happy that they were able to move on because there's only so many ATEX he can have. And he says, I mean, part of his thrill in life is when they come back to him and they've moved on and they have a different job, they thank him for the training that they provided. And while he's providing all of this training, the, the C's become B's and the B's become A's. So if he loses an A because he can't, you know, he, a B is about ready to move up because he's gotten all that training. He believes his customers and his shop and his profitability has benefited from all of that training. Big time service. He, he told me 400 hours a year is what he invests in his technicians. And that's online and that's leader led. I mean, they do a lot of lunch and learns. That culture does exist. It's out there. You can go to vision and walk out with a hurting brain. And that's good because when you work that muscle, it grows. Are you suggesting that his technicians each are doing 400 hours a year 
you know, to, as a collective group, he's he's investing in four hundred hours in his in his group. It's about a hundred hours a guy. When you break down an hour a couple of times a week, you know, he's buying pizzas and subs and they're they're jumping into their training room watching a video or an online class. It's it's a big investment. Fifty two weeks times two hours a week. There's your number. But you know, they don't do it all the time. G- great episode. A heck of a guy. And he's all in on training. And they're out there. There are shop owners out. You know, shop owners that that are out there that do that. We have to become evangelical and get up on our soapboxes and grab a tech or grab a shop owner and get them to sign up for a regional class. And especially when there's one of the great trainers that are out there going to be teaching. Boy, did I hear a lot of great things about Jim Morton in Philadelphia last week. Wait to hear his episode about, you know, how warm it is for him to see the students go beyond and, and, and way beyond what his expectations were of them five, six, seven, eight, ten years later, because he's been teaching for 22 years now. The shop owner that you had just mentioned obviously strives to deliver the best product he can, right? And with his technicians, obviously, he's selling service. Uh, it's very much like what Kevin's doing. He's trying to put together the best talent, the best, you know, best skill set and build the business that way. That is a minority approach, I believe. Either it's it's a good thing or a bad thing that I believe that an episode like Leon Anderson's out there will change somebody. Even if it's just one person, when it gets aired, somebody's going to listen to it and say, I'm an owner, I need to step up. I'm a tech, I need to convince my owner. If not, I need to find a place that has a commitment and a culture of training. I guess I'm, I'm saying if we weren't writing articles and if we, weren't, if we weren't voicing podcasts and discussing some of these really tough challenges in our industry, if I can change one person with one episode, we've, you know, we're just going to keep doing it. The conversation is important you know, a continued conversation because eventually enough people start conversing and action takes place. You were talking earlier about this shop owner with all his uh, training hours. And I don't know if he's uh, the person that coined the phrase, but where I heard it first was Jim Linder saying he'd rather train a guy, train a tech, train an employee and have them leave than not train them and have them stay. Yep. I've heard that. And that's been around for 20 some years that everybody who believes in training has adopted, but there's not enough people that believe in that. Maybe people like my boss have figured it out. He gets a guy like me, gets a tech like me, an employee like me, who finds a way to go to a training conference. Vision can. Can's the recent one. Found a way to get there. My own dime, my own money. I get there. Uh, I have help, you know, Baumhart, a really good friend of mine's there. Uh, split the cost of her room, that helps. And then I go to these classes, and namely, the Jeremy O'Neill classes were very eye-opening for me. So I come back to the shop, you know, Monday morning with all these ideas of, we're doing this stuff wrong. We got to rethink how we do this. We need to rethink how we do that. The shop and my employer are benefiting greatly off that. With what investment? Can you imagine if he went? If he went and, you know, you have to started be viewing to that with... You have well, to be willing to learn, though. <laughs> willing to learn, and then also it's back to and this able. value thing. Seeing the value, you know, hearing me come back, showing him the book, talking about the class, talking about these ideas, and going, when the, you know, it comes to the pay period, signing that check, going, well, Matt sat in class Friday and Saturday you know what, I, I got to, this check isn't enough. Let me write a different one. And then when he hands it to me, say, hey, thanks for that investment. Thanks for the time in class. I paid you for those two days. That doesn't happen. Otherwise, if you can't afford it, the shop isn't profitable enough yet, at least take them aside, take the employee aside and say, hey, I really appreciate it. And I will make this right. You know, I worked for a shop a number of years ago, he hired me and uh, said, in six months, we will review where you're at and uh, uh, we can talk wages. I was the highest producer the shop had ever seen, given what other employees 
had told me. I found out other people were making more hourly wages than I was. And when the six months came, I'm like, hey, what, what happened? I can't afford it. Well, he was able to afford a whole lot of, of equipment to put in the place. He had agreed to pay vision. Well, it took me some bitching to get paid back for that. And it's like a corporate executive in my world where I'm okay paying myself $10 million or the board pays me $10 million, but I'm not willing to spread some of that wealth around to the people that get me here. I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot of tax showing up at Vision and not just tax, tax service advisors, managers, all that. Employees of auto repair who are going to these training events, local or national, finding a way, maybe the shop or maybe the business pays for the class itself, the class package, but they're paying for the hotel, they're paying all their meals, the travel. They're finding a way. The big shop operators, they're paying the whole dime. I know guys that have taken two or three of their techs to Apex this year for training, and they've taken and they've closed the shop and they've taken them full dime to vision. And they're busy, they're strong, they're industry leaders. How how do they do it? Maybe, you know, I need to get these guys together and really write the process of how it works. Frankly, guys, it's in the heart. You know, they've hired guys with good heads, good heart, and the culture of being a perpetual student is there. Constant learning, constant education. Yes, and it's the same premise as a tech like me who finds a way to get to the training, finds a way to get the stuff. I want, you know, OE scan tools, manufacturer scan tools. I find a way to get them. If you set up your business plan, your business philosophy to do, like you're saying, what these exceptions to the rules do, you find a way to make that happen. You're investing in training. Uh, you could have spent the money on tools, but you carved some of that money off to training. You know, instead of buying a boat, I got scan tools. Instead of buying a four-wheeler, I got training. Instead of buying a nicer house, I got tools and training. And the best part about that, Matt, is... They depreciate to nothing. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I'm just, well, I'm saying if, if you're a, a business right. owner and you have this idea, you have this goal and you really, it is a passion of yours to make that happen, you will find a way to make it happen. Training, business coaches, uh, you might end up specializing. Maybe you specialize in a limited number of car lines. Maybe you specialize in certain areas of the car or you have technicians working for you that specialize in areas of the car, all driving, you know, this business to accomplish the goals set forth by the business owner. How so big of a business do you have to have to have that many techs or, or do you just specialize that deep where, I mean, think about the two, three, four base shops. I mean, with, I mean, really one or two technicians. Right. But then do they just say, there's only so much we can do. It might be all makes all models, but we just can't get into deep diagnostics. Why would I go there? Right. Or I'm okay with shut. I'm okay with closing those shops. Get, oh, yeah. Don't get me wrong. I'm okay. And the, the competent tech is going to be able to find a, a job at a better shop in a bigger shop or whatever. It's just one of those things that you cannot have a large shop uh, mentality and think that it's going to work in awesome uh, shops. I mean, you, d you don't work in a very large shop to some extent surprised that he has somebody of your caliber on staff just because, I mean, like talking to uh, other people, it's one of those things that, I mean, a shop at 20 bays and uh, you can't necessarily have a guy of your caliber, busy all the time doing all the diags to keep all the rest of the guys busy. Uh, I know you do a whole lot more than automotive diags and stuff. I mean, you're doing management stuff as well. So that that's where the page turns with you. All right. More bays, there's going to be more A techs too. A majority of the techs out there are C techs. And then there's a whole lot of B techs. There is such a minute amount of A-Tex, it's ridiculous. I consider myself a B-Tech. 
I would never consider myself an A tech. I don't approve of your grading curve, sir. Yeah, but think about what you do today, Bob. You're going into dealer, you're going into collision shops, working on car models that are like five months out of being sold, doing a blind spot calibration, and no one in the collision shop has ever seen it. You haven't even seen it, but you've got you've got the wherewithal to make it right, to make it work. What makes that not being an A-tech? What you're describing is following service information and being able to perform a service. Oh. It's, it's correct tooling and being able to read. That's part of it, Bob. I, I think you're being a little unfair. I think there's, you know, at the, when you get to the top of anything, the majority, I mean, grading systems are for the majority of people, right? I would say, yeah. you know, even, even in school, there may not be tests that can test what some crazy genius knows, right? They're, they're still lumped with the A's. You know, you're, you're definitely an A tech. There's no question about that, Bob. That, that's just insane to consider you a B tech. You know, guys, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, whatever a grading system. Uh, it, so there really isn't anything in our world or society that says he's an A tech because of this. We, I think we have come up with this grading just to determine what we pay people and what they're, you know, what, what, we, what kind of expertise we would give them, you know, a, a job. There's there really I mean you can't look on the wall right behind you Bob and see the certificate that says I'm an A tech. It's it's your capabilities, what you're willing to tackle, what you know. That you know you can you can jump into a job, use all the pieces of logic that you have, all the training, and and get something done on time, profitably. And I bet you every owner has a different grading system. <laughs> you may find an A tech what, what one guy calls an A tech in in this shop and an A-Tech and another, and give them a, they, they may be two different levels of competencies. Because the B-Tech in a shop that doesn't have anybody else is an A-Tech to the owner. <laughs> he's the best he's got. Matt, are you seeing much uh, A-Tech uh, stuff come in the shop? And if you have or are, what about calibration? Uh, it's a problem. Yeah, we I see some, not nearly to the degree those two do. Uh, Pete and Bob see more in a day for sure a week than I do and probably a few months, but it's definitely uh, becoming much more prevalent because uh, I, we do a lot of work for body shops in the area. So when they do service work, they send it all over or I go over there and do some programming or whatnot. And, and uh, more and more of these calibrations are coming up. Some of them, you just, you know, proper scan tools, really all you need and following procedure, a test drive usually. Uh, other ones, you need targets, and sometimes you can find out uh, dimensions of the targets and maybe build one yourself, or they are affordable, and then there's ones that are way not affordable, and it would be very, very hard to justify it as a a shop that may see a limited number of those vehicles purchasing said target. I've seen one. Um, it was at the Detroit Connected Cars thing. Uh, I think it was in May of this year, 2017. $18,000 was this calibration unit, and they actually showed everything and how it worked. Car had to be on a level space. There, there were you know tape measures, and, and and it was amazing how it all had to come together. And it was a process. You had to do the front and the rear wheel. Are you ever going to invest and in, in have, say, a van in the Chicago area with all that stuff on it? That target system, I thought, was a very impressive target system. And the setup for it was pretty impressive. For us to have that target system, there's no way it would work. It's too big to be mobile. It's, it's an in-shop, plant the thing, and uh, you might be able to roll it around a little bit. Obviously, it has some wheels on it because you have to adjust some distances. As far as it being uh, workable for a mobile-style business, it, it, no way. I talked to Kevin about it and said, if uh, depending on costs and stuff, it might be something that we might want to put at uh, our uh, brick-and-mortar facility. I had contacted... Bosch uh, via email uh, and telephone, and nobody could give me a price on that, and nobody could tell me if the OE has signed off on it. And I think 
the last part was the more important part. Because if the OE doesn't sign off on it, who has all the liability? That's a big problem in, t- in the litigious uh, society we live in. So the, the other thought that I had, and there were a bunch of us milling around there in Detroit, and somebody was passing around these these big dollar signs, like $18,000, and, and, and how cumbersome it was. They were even discussing the fact that if it was snowing out, um, or there wasn't an if the, if they they almost would have to close the windows in the shop because of the reflection of the whatever the calibration I don't know if it's lidar radar I don't know what the thought was someday it'll self calibrate because the software will get smarter the equipment will get smarter the technology will get better and someday it'll just self calibrate right and so many ADAS systems are calibrating themselves already. Um, what, with obviously some special tooling for when issues do arise. Yeah, some of them you just put them in a calibration mode and go drive them. It depends on the system you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously. I mean, are you t- and, and the manufacturer. Are you talking about um, a lane keep? Are you talking about a blind spot? Um, are you talking about adaptive cruise control? Every one of those either can be done by one manufacturer or another, has a procedure to drive. Correct. And what's odd is some procedures have gone from, I mean, manufacturers gone from procedures where it was just a drive to now I'm going to require a static uh, calibration with targets and a drive. Nobody seems to be able to get onto the same page as to how to make these things work the best. So the mobile diagnostician, you guys are really seeing the cutting edge. You're investing in all of the right equipment. This seems like it's going to be an incredibly growing segment of our industry. To me, no matter how good the shop is, if they see, you know, a system, an an ADA system come in, even on a mechanical issue, you know, something happened, it's not collision. Windshield repaired. Bingo. Exactly right. I had one on Monday that uh, windshield was replaced. I went to do a uh, lane keep and it failed because it was the aftermarket windshield and uh, it could not see the right side target. And the reality is I've done other lane keep for the same manufacturer. What was jump in the car, turn the scan to a lawn, tell it to go into calibration mode and two miles later I'm done. Would a technician today, A, B, or C, uh, be smart to attend a class on ATIS? It would depend on who was putting the class on. I think that you'd have to do your due diligence. I think if you go to the class, like I went to this class um, in uh, the summer on ATIS, there was definitely some information out there. It was more of a sales class on that target system. There's definitely some misinformation in there as well. So I got this presentation that says common vehicles requiring ATIS reset after a wheel alignment today. Dodge Charger, Challenger, Durango, Chrysler 200, 300, Jeep Cherokee, Grand Cherokee, Renegade, and on. (laughs) It goes back to this, what we're talking about. Technology is here, guys. You've got to know about it, learn about it. The reality is like blind spot. Um, the manufacturer says if you take the blind spot monitor, uh, depending on my, some manufacturers is what I should say, you take that blind spot monitor sensor off and you put it back on, you should calibrate it. So, in, I mean, according to the rule of law, because they make the rule of law in that case, you should do the calibration. Is it going to work or not work if you don't do the calibration, the reality is with the blind spot stuff that I've seen, it works. It's a different story if, I mean, metal's bent and the thing's not aimed correctly and the rest of the thing. But if there's I'm literally unbolt, take it off, put it back on, tighten the screws, it, it should be in the same place. Is there a way to test for that? Yeah. So if you've got an aligned car and you get a new set of tires, and you put the thing on the alignment rack, and you adjust a slighted toe adjustment or something or whatever, or you have an alignment 
a ball joint that's replaced, whatever, and you adjust the alignment, do you actually have to do the ATIS by rule of law? Because that's the manufacturer says you should. Is it going to work or not work? Should work fine. Should work fine. I mean, when they write their information, they have to assume that you're unable to apply common sense or you know, some sort of deductive reasoning as to whether or not what you did would, could, or should affect. Let's the face it. I mean, how much money did that woman in Arizona get for burning herself with hot coffee? People have lost the ability to accept personal responsibility and think with some form of common sense. Right. And that's why we have devices that are going to do it for us. Why would an engineer say that on a Jeep Cherokee or Grand Cherokee, after a wheel alignment, you have to um, take a I look at the very Seriously, that an engineer said that. Yeah. The lawyer did. Yes. Can you think of a way or a reason or a purpose or some situation where any other repairs that were done could affect this? I doubt very seriously that an engineer actually came out and said, well, we're going to put this on and... Um, Anytime the tires are rotated, it better be calibrated. It's absurd. When TPMS came out, I had a salesperson from the parts store come in and tell me, oh my gosh, this class about TPMS, blah, 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 blah. If you take the tires off the car to do a brake job, you have to do a TPMS relearn. I'm like, are you freaking stupid? You're taking the tire off and you're not moving it? You got to do a TPMS learn? I mean... Think for just half a second. So here is, are these companies on this sheet that I'm kind of showing these guys in the virtual studio. And let, let's, let, me, let me make a crazy assumption that 75% of this stuff to 80% is not even being, no one even knows. They're just doing an alignment done. That's the shortcuts that exist in our world today that even as much as maybe that was the professional way to do it, there's so many shortcuts so many. Uh, there's probably 90% of the people that don't even know that, that uh, I'm not sure if this is a policy, if this is a, you know, a, a tech bull, and I don't know what that is. Where did this come from? Well, you know, we, we haven't even scratched the surface with ATIS and, and all the stuff and, and, and all the things that you're doing, Bob, uh, with these, you know, later model things. But I'm so happy we talked about training. I'm in this altruistic mode that maybe we just uh, some shop owners and some techs that are going to hear this, they're, they're, they're going to say, you know, as, as much as these guys are fun, fun to listen to, they have so many great points because they care so much about our industry and they know where they've come from and they know where they still have to go. And, and you guys, again, let's talk about as much fun as we had. You guys are some serious, serious guys who understand and care for this industry. Given that point, I think that one thing that we didn't touch on in that conversation on training is there's a lot of trainers out there that put in a B or C effort. And maybe if they would step up their game and maybe put in some A effort and make sure their uh, topic and coverage is correct and that would also help the industry. That's you can't go to a class and walk out of there with I'm supposed to know have good information and have it wrong information. Misinformation is worse than no information. That's why I was thinking going full circle, coming back to where we were talking about maybe certifications or licensing, licensure type conversations. Maybe training is where it starts, and I'm not talking about just everybody attending it, but maybe we start kind of licensing training or we start regulating training. That'd be a great idea. Right? That maybe that's where yeah. it starts. Is you I'm start regulating the stick. training. I'm silent only for the reason that as you know, here's here's how my mind works. You you say what you just said and I start trying to formulate the process and the system and the who and the why and the when. And I, I hit a wall. Because I wasn't quite sure how 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 to do it, and it does it, it doesn't matter. There's people way above my pay grade that could figure it out, but what an idea! I, I think it has to because you know we we talk about training and we talk about some pretty good training. Bob mentioned some not so good training, and there is a lot of not good training. 
more than there is really good training. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Then there's the just like different levels and whatever the levels would be, but a rating system or if not a rating system, you know, at Amazon, you can go on, look at a product and people will tell you, did they or didn't they like it? Where's the open bulletin board? IATN may have something like that. Right, Matt? Oh, I'll suggest that to Scott Brown. Well, you know what? On Facebook, there's uh, some training stuff going out, but you have to have um, a a real backbone and willing to say, hey, uh, I don't care if they kick me off of here. I'm going to speak the truth because the reality is some of the training stuff on Facebook is sponsored by Mm. training companies. And even the social groups on social media and, and probably mainly Facebook right now. It wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have it there, Matt. Yeah. And it takes a lot of backbone for somebody to say, I went to this class by so-and-so and it was horrific. Yeah. You know, the content's wrong. It would take a lot. Cause well, not only that, I mean, a lot of people don't necessarily have the time to sit there and support their idea, you know, over the course of multiple days. Should you make that comment? Listen, we covered a ton of good stuff. We'll never change the world, but we just may incite a riot. Hey, thanks, Matt Fonslow, Bob Hype, and Peter Landry. Thanks for your passion and your commitment to drive a stronger aftermarket. Hey, find extended bios and the talking points at remarkableresults.biz slash E273. Hey, don't forget about one of the easiest ways to listen to the podcast on your smart device. Go to your app store and type in Remarkable Results Radio and click to install. It's your own podcast listening app for automotive aftermarket wisdom. Every episode release is at your fingertips. Hey, I love it when you write. Drop me a line at carm at remarkableresults.biz or head over to the contact page on the website. You are an important reason I bring you these interviews so you can profit from the answers found in each episode. Thanks, and listen hard. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time...